Hello, I'm Jonathan Tobin, Editor-in-Chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org, and you're listening to Top Story, a weekly podcast where I analyze the most important stories happening in Jewish news around the world. Each week, I will break down politics, foreign policy, and culture to provide insights into what is going on behind the headlines. Professor Gerald Steinberg is founder and president of NGO Monitor and professor emeritus at Bar Ilan University, where he founded the program on conflict management and negotiation. His research focuses on Middle East diplomacy and security, the politics of human rights and non governmental organizations, and Israeli politics and arms control. He's previously been awarded a prestigious Israel Science Foundation grant, he's a member of Israel's Council of Foreign Affairs and uh, is part of the Interparliamentary Coalition for Combating Anti-Semitism. His op-eds have appeared in publications like the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, Haaretz, Jerusalem Post, and other publications. He has appeared as a commentator on BBC, CNN, MSNBC, Al Jazeera, and NPR. Gerald Steinberg, welcome to Top Story. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. It's our pleasure. Uh, first off, Gerald, um, can you give us the background um, uh, on the recent controversy involving the Palestinian NGOs and the PFLP, and what led to Israel's defense ministry to make this decision, and how you think this is going to play out? We're not privy to the process which led the Minister of Defense to make this designation of six Palestinian, prominent Palestinian NGOs as uh, terrorist fronts as uh, acting for the uh, Popular Front for Liberation of Palestine. But there are a series of events that took place that make sense. I'll go back to uh, August 2019, when uh, a hiker by the name of family uh, were out uh, near a spring, and the 17-year-old by the name of Rena Schnerb was killed by a, a roadside explosive. And uh, about a few months later, a uh, group of uh, as many as 50 uh, terrorists involved in this were arrested. And some of the key people turned out to be names that uh, we recognize from the NGO business and what the Ministry of Defense also recognized. For instance, uh, the, the head of the, the, uh, the cell, Samir Arbid, was both the uh, commander in the PFLP and also wore the hat, he wore two hats, the treasurer or the accountant for the United Agricultural Workers Committees, which is a significant in terms of budget and other things, we can talk about that later, uh, in Palestinian NGO. And it's actually been affiliated, known to be affiliated with the PFLP for a number of years. There were other, there was another um, UAWC member who was also arrested. He's also been tried and convicted for having a role in that uh, terror attack. And there are a number of other people that were connected to that, that both have NGO hats and have PFLP, uh, not just hats, but weapons and explosives and other things. I think at that point, the Ministry of Defense and, and the security agencies, including the uh, what's known as the uh, Israel Security Agency, the Shabak in uh, colloquial Hebrew, they decided this was a serious issue that uh, the PFLP, which had been relatively dormant for a number of years, was doing serious terror attacks, and they were using their NGO connections to raise funds to, uh, as cover, to gain legitimacy, access connections with European governments, all sorts of other things. So uh, we don't, again, we don't know the process. We do know that uh, about um, sometime in 2020, the defense ministry also declared an, an organization that was part of the PFLP network, the Health Workers Committee. You know, the UAWC does agriculture, they do health, they do got money for doing Corona, all sorts of other things. And uh, there, was a, there was a raid on their offices. They were uh, declared a, a terrorist organization and uh, one of their key people was arrested. And this was a, a rare public statement. They, they specified the charges against her primarily diverting funds in all sorts of different ways that are provided by European governments that were designated for health towards very specific PFLP activities. The indictment talked about, or the, the charge sheet talked about uh, 
bank specific bank accounts and, and all sorts of other things that she had done. So as this evidence built up and as the the uh, the breadth of this network became clearer to the uh, defense ministry, they, they I assume they gathered uh, various sources of intelligence, uh, confirmed more than what NGO Monitor had been able to do. By the way, we have a, a we identified 13 groups. So there were there was the original HWC and now six. So there's seven that have been designated by the Ministry of Defense. And, and as this developed, at some point they decided they were going to go ahead and make this public. And that's what happened uh, last week, at the end of last week. Yeah. So as you're outlining this, I mean, as far as the world is concerned, I mean, if you read the account of this uh, in the New York Times, these were just quote unquote civil society organizations that are being targeted by Israel. We learned nothing about the, the dual role, but what you're describing is that these are really front organizations. They're not, you know, philanthropies that got infiltrated by, you know, a couple of bad guys, um, which is actually uh, foreign minister Yair Lapid was saying, well, there's some good guys and there's some bad guys in them. What you're describing is something, you know, much worse that these are actually front organizations created to um, allow nonprofit money to come into a, a group that is directly controlled or, or you know, connect, not really connected, but as well as controlled by the PFLP. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you said, and I'll say more about that. There's a lot more detail. And it's also, I'll, I'll do a little bit of my own autobiography and the process of how, how I started Please. to put, it's, it's like connecting the dots and you see a dot here and a dot there and then, oh, there's an elephant here or there's a, whatever it is, this is in this case, a, a terrorist network. And it was very clever. It goes back to at least, the, I'd say the 80s, maybe the early 90s. It started with an organization called Al Haq, which uh, I won't go through the whole history of that organization, but the head of the organization for the last 20 plus years is a gentleman by the name of Shawan Jabarin. He was an employee, he was a staff member, called himself a researcher, whatever it was. He had been arrested, convicted, and spent time in Israeli jails for being a PFLP, not just a member, but having been active in recruiting and training of PFLP members. And that became, that's something that I sort of came up with um, maybe 2007 or so when he was uh, quite visible there when he tried, he was given awards around the world. He was embraced and hugged as a great Palestinian human rights uh, uh, activist. Uh, and uh, he applied to, to go collect those awards in, in Europe. And the Israeli uh, security people said, no, you can't leave the country. It was taken to the Israeli court. And the Israeli high court, which is not known for its um, hard line, let's say, on these issues, their, their decision was he, the, the security service was right that uh, he was, and this is a quote they said in Hebrew, they called him a Jekyll and Hyde in Hebrew. And they said specifically that he's a human rights activist by day and a terrorist by night. So there's one example, and Al Haq is the most visible, most well-known of these organizations. They have status in the United Nations. Uh, they speak and they appear, and, and Sharon Jabarin shows up and negotiates with the European diplomats on the text of the condemnations of Israel in Geneva at the Human Rights Council. And Jabarin goes to the International Criminal Court and is always photographed there with these huge piles of a documentation of Israeli war crimes. And it, it, it's a big organization, which has lots of people. It's Jabarin's uh, baby, it's Jabarin's uh, framework. And it's one of the most visible in what we often call delegitimization or demonization of Israel. He's also, by the way, on the Middle East Board of Human Rights Watch. Ken Roth loves him. And he's got a position in uh, the French uh, version of Amnesty, the Federation of uh, International Federation of, of Human Rights. So Jabarin was, was uh, Al Haq was the key there. Uh, and I think then we began to see other organizations, Defense of Children Palestine, International Palestine, DCIP, that became visible in the late 90s and began, these all got European funding and that allowed them to expand their activities and their visibility and their legitimacy greatly. And then there's Adamir, which is a prisoner's rights organization. They all have people, a number of people in some cases, we've identified seven or eight, and I'll talk a minute, or you can ask me, and I'll tell you how we identified this from open sources. But uh, so the pattern became clear. I think that this was a very clever move. 
by the leaders of the Popular Front for Liberation of Palestine. It started off, I won't go through the whole history, George Habash, airplane hijackings and, and uh, mm -hmm. blowing them up back in the 70s. And then it went through a sort of a hiatus and then it was reconstituted re, uh, or restored. They're members of the PLO. They're opposed to Oslo. So they're the uh, rejectionist front, uh, the, uh, somewhere between Fatah and the PLO and Hamas outside the PLO. That's their political philosophy. They're originally Marxist. I'm not sure that has any meaning now. And a lot of them are Christians, by the way. And so that gave them access to yes, churches in Habash, Europe. And, right? Yeah, but it, all the people, that most of the people that we see as heads of the NGOs also have Christian, uh, they, they went to uh, Christian uh, institutions. They, you can see that on, on some of their bios. So they understood back in the, I, I'd say by the, by the early 90s, Jabberine first than others, that being an NGO has tremendous advantages. We're not going to obviously say we're terrorists. We are human rights activists. We do agricultural development for the poor Palestinians. We provide health services. We protect Palestinian children. We, we campaign for prisoners. Each one of these has its own sort of, uh, I would say, niche, but it's more of a, a theoretical niche because they all do more or less the same thing with the themes and variations. They were very clever and they got their UN certification, they got their European funding, they do their due diligence in terms of their European uh, patrons, all of that stuff. So I think that that is, and I don't know of other examples where it, Fatah has a couple of these that came later, but the, the PFLP was very, very smart in doing this. Now, that's very interesting in the way that you've outlined it, in that it's created by the PFLP but it's funded by the Europeans. It's it's uh, kashered as it will, as it were, by the United Nations and by the groups that are sort of the human rights international community and Human Rights Watch, Amnesty, and it all works together. It's not you know just you know a couple of people in the West Bank doing something. This is part of an international network. Um, which doesn't mean necessarily that the UN is part of the PFLP, but you know the point is they're all they're all working together, but it's being controlled at at, at, the, at the you know the business end by a group whose main interest is terrorist terrorism and rejection. All of which is true. One of the the uh... you were Gerald. Why don't you jump in with what you were saying? Okay, just remind me what the, anybody remember the um, last thing? I we said were talking on? about how the UN and okay. Human Rights Watch all work together with these groups. The, uh, I think the, the, I won't say surprising because it, you know, in this business, you, you can be very, you learn to be cynical and you see the hip, blatant hypocrisies. But the Europeans were early uh, responders. I don't know if there's probably a better term, early adopters, adapters. Way back again, Al Haq. I, I use Al Haq as, as my primary example, but they all follow the same pattern. Back in the '90s, even earlier, the they were um, they funded a lot of the early activities of Al Haq. A conference in Europe, uh, gathering a, uh, a set of protests, whatever it was that was going on. That funding came from, and I think that the people there have said, "Wow, this is we've hit the gold mine here, the mother load." Uh, and they had their enthusiasts, a lot of university to university agreements were signed and, and all under the, um, the heading of promoting peace, democracy, human rights, international law, just over and over. And in some ways, the Europeans lined up to give first al Haq and then all the other organizations money. Uh, one of the other things which is interesting in all of this, this is far beyond what the defense ministry has published, but I think it certainly things that are well known and NGO Monitor, having seen this, this process develop as documented, the same group of NGOs, Palestinians as well as Israelis, we're talking about 15 to 20 at the most, and the Palestinians is, is a smaller group, and these uh, PFLP are at the top of the list, get money every single year from 15 sometimes more different European government frameworks. Each government has a, a support system, a network, or rather a, a framework for funding human rights and democracy and Palestinians and Israelis and all that other stuff. And then, so that's already uh, 14, 13, 14 governments from Finland down to Spain. 
in Italy. The only one that doesn't do it is Greece and the Western Europe and, uh, and, the, and the EU itself. And then there are church groups that are funded by the governments, all sorts of, of um, overlapping funding. So they are making millions upon millions. And I, I really do think the Europeans are lining up to give them money because that's part of the ethos, really. That's it's also a core part of European foreign policy. At the same time that these organizations, it's obviously symbiotic, as these organizations were being founded and funded, the Europeans said, this is good for us because I think it's also part of a way of competing with the United States. We always see the NGO European grants in terms of the projects they define, which are largely fictitious, but it's a lot of paperwork. So if there's a, an agreement, the Americans move the embassy to Jerusalem, and immediately afterwards, the Europeans announce projects for strengthening the Palestinian identity in Jerusalem going through the NGOs. And guess who gets the, the, the contracts? It's these same NGOs. So it's, it's a very close relationship. Uh, I'm watching on Twitter as the, all the Europeans come out against the move by the Israeli government and condemn it. These are civil society organizations. None of them, zero comment on the, the terror aspects at all. And then I, I mentioned the, the mm -hmm. 2019 uh, murder of Rena Schneer, but there are other examples as well. But the, you see, and they have pictures, they've invited them to sit around the table and have their pictures taken. These are in many ways, Europe's primary consultants, both the Palestinian NGOs and the Israeli NGOs in their policy on promoting European interests and, and two states and all those other things and, and peace and Israeli withdrawal to the pre-67 lanes. This is, these are subcontractors. They're not mm -hmm. civil society organizations. There is no Palestinian civil society when you're, have a, you're caught between Fatah and, and the PFLP and the Hamas. It's, this is, it's all a fiction, but the Europeans have, have somewhat, some of them naively perhaps, and some of them well, eyes wide open, hey, these guys, these organizations are really very helpful to us. And yeah. that, that's mm -hmm. a big part of the story as well. In fact, I, I'll just I, add one more quick point, and that is- Sure, please. That I, I think to a significant degree, the decision by the Ministry of Defense and Benny Gantz in particular to do this is, has to do with sending a message to the Europeans. These organizations will find some way or they won't find some way of doing whatever they're gonna do, but if Europeans have to stop funding this for, or risk a, a big pushback from Israel, which has not happened until now. And that's what's maybe caught a lot of them off guard. Yeah, I think part of the context that people who don't really study the way Palestinian society, Palestinian political culture works, is when you say, well, they're terrorists, they're connected to terrorists, they imagine there's this huge gap between ordinary Palestinians and some terrorist movement operating in a cave as if it's, you know, Al-Qaeda, you know, or, you yep. know, or, you know, ISIS. Um, but in fact, you know, Palestinian terror groups and their political wings compose Palestinian society, you, you know, it would be remarkable if any member of such groups were not in some way connected to these groups, um, just like in, in Palestinian universities, you know, Palest you know, anything, any other sector of their society you could you think of, because, you know, these terror groups and their political wings basically control everything, don't they? Thank you. That's an important point. You know, you're right about the university when the universities have student elections. Right? Who are the, the, the parties? There are parties that compete. There are lists. There's a Fatah list. There's a PFLP list. There's a Hamas list. There's some other lists. And, and that's across the board. And it's actually, that's another aspect of this whole thing. So NGO Monitor through Facebook and YouTube and other open sources, but just by having very intelligent people in our research group who know the Arabic and look at the websites and look at all these things and see, hey, Here's a name in a PFLP event. They're holding a me memorial for somebody who was killed in a clash with Israeli occupation forces. And here's the same guy or the same woman, same name, same face, same everything. And they were doing an NGO event. And the, it's so closely integrated. And so what there is, the Palestinian response is, the PFLP is a political party. We're not terrorists, so they don't say that. We are a legitimate political party, Fatah which has its own terror wings, obviously, is a legitimate political party. Hamas is a political party. And that's exactly the context of this. Uh, we just happen to do terror on the side as, as, as part of the explanation. We uh -huh. see the names of the same people 
on the political lists. So we, had, as I started to say, we had we've identified seventy three individuals in thirteen organizations. About two thirds are in the six that have been designated, or the, the seven, because I talked about the additional one earlier that have been designated. And some of these people are on the list running for the Palestinian Legislative Council. Last time they had elections and whatever it was uh, 14 years ago, or for a local, some sort of local election. So they're identified as PFLP activists or members in a number of different ways. And that one of them is through the political process. And you're absolutely, it's not just that, that they're political parties, they're sophisticated. They have very um, active and visible social media uh, visibility postings constantly. If you look at their, their tweets in the last three or four days, it's out there, it's out there in 10 different languages. They're engaging, we are being accused, we are being shut down. This is an attempt to prevent Palestinian civil society from all that, all the standard cliches. They're good at it. Mm. Yeah, I think the question, the, the next question for you is, let's talk for a minute about what these groups actually do when they're not, you know, when, when they're not committing terrorism, when they're not directly involved in terrorism in that their civil society, quote unquote, civil society work is not philanthropy. It's actually all oriented, isn't it, towards propaganda aimed at delegitimizing Israel or promoting BDS or just straight up anti-Semitism. Um, that's the civil society, um, isn't it? It, it you know, as much as you know, when they talk about taking care of prisoners, this is just another part of you know, pay for pay for slay, isn't it? it, it it's not really civil society. It's about mobilizing Palestinian society with European money to for the for the conflict against Israel for the continuation of the one hundred year old war on Zionism. I, I'll add an extra level to that. It's not so much mobilizing Palestinian society; it's mobilizing anti-Israel, um, so international, the international community in quotes. So al Haq is almost entirely, it's really interesting to look at this stuff. <laughs> I guess <laughs> I'm addicted, right? So if al Haq, which has been around for many years and produces a ton of reports, almost every day they'll do a submission, a report, then plus the social media, other things. But they're all about Israel commits war crimes, Israel's an apartheid state, Israel's a racist state, all of those things. They do a token amount because it's in their contract of uh, Palestinian violations, internal violations of human rights. So when the Palestinian Authority arrests a, you know, a critic and opponent, they'll do a couple days on that and then they'll drop it. So it's like 90 10, it's somewhere like a 90 10 percent ratio uh, focusing on the outside. They do certainly do BDS. DCIP, Defense for Children International Palestine. If I, I'll give you the short version, and then I'll give you a longer version. You'll tell me when I go Please. too much detail, too much information. No, DCIP, we can't have too much information on this. Go ahead. DCIP is very active, primarily active. Most Palestinians don't know who they are. They're very active in Washington, in the U.S., in Brussels, from the European Union. They've done stuff in Canada, all of it in the, in the parliaments and in the capitals, holding events. They have a, an operative with a non-Arabic sounding name named Brad Parker. Brad Parker was invited, and then disinvited, but originally invited to address the Security Council on Israeli violations of, Pal of the rights of Palestinian children. Torture, they say, of Palestinian children. That's their main theme. He was then uninvited when uh, it turned out that the Belgian uh, government, which held the chair of the Security Council at the time, understood, was informed about the terror connections and, and the fact that they also had zero credibility. They're just 100% propaganda organization. Just as a, a side a parenthetical comment, their primary goal is to have Israel be listed on the UN Secretary General's list, blacklist of um, organizations and countries that violate the Convention um, on Children in Armed Conflict, uh, along with uh, Boko Haram, and uh, I think Taliban is on that, maybe, maybe not anymore, and uh, Al Qaeda and ISIS. And, and, and let's put on, and, and they do this full time. That's their campaign. And it may sound ridiculous, but Betty McCollum, member of Congress from Minnesota, has now introduced in three consecutive sessions of Congress, covering at least six years, a bill 
which they wrote the language. We look at the language. It's DCIP language. And Brad Parker and others go and testify and speak in, in various uh, uh, congressional events. They're not going to get that bill passed. And occasionally some other members of Congress will sign on. If they're not the squad, they find out this is a terror linked organization. They sign off. But they've made the that they do the propaganda. And they, as I said, they do it more successfully in Brussels, in London, in Ottawa, and various other places as well. So this is exactly what DCIP does. They're not providing humanitarian aid. They're not making Pal the Palestinian Authority any less uh, draconian. Uh, but they are promoting very much the propaganda war, the demonization of Israel, and there's nothing better than to accuse Israel of torturing children to do that. And that's, that's what the Europeans are paying for. Yeah, that, I think that's a very important point in that, you know, everybody cares about children, everybody is sympathetic to children. But, you know, if you were really doing civil society, number one, they're doing propaganda. Number two, if they were really interested in building up civil society, you know, among Palestinians, they'd be focusing on the Palestinian Authority. That would be their real thing, because that's, that's the force that prevents, you know, the, the corrupt um, authoritarian group that rules the lives of Palestinians, and uh, far more than Israel does in, in terms of their day to day lives, and prevents the emergence of a free economy and, you know, sort of good governance, the thing that you would think civil society groups would be focused on. Um, and yet, um, that's not what they're about at all, is it? Well, and if there are a couple of uh, attempts, there were a couple of attempts to focus on the internal Palestinian human rights issues. Uh, I think kneecapping is probably an understatement for what the people who started doing that went through. Uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Bassam Eid who is very dedicated to this and has had constant uh, threats against him and more. And I'll just add that he has applied to the European Union for funding for his human rights organization and has gotten exactly zero because he doesn't do what they want them, what they're looking for. So yes, there's plenty of room for uh, pressing democratic norms, developing uh, processes, due process within the Palestinian society. But these NGOs are, are part of the problem. When you're closely, it's not just closely linked, when you're part of the Popular Front for Liberation of Palestine, which is important to note, and it gets, we'll maybe talk about the State Department in a minute, but the United States defines the PFLP as a terror organization or designates, as does the European Union and Canada. So there's no debate about whether the PFLP is terrorist. The debate is whether these members and activists and commanders and terrorists within the PFLP that were NGO hats all of a sudden become a, uh, an entirely different entity. And that's, uh, that, that's the point that has to be gotten across here. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about how these groups cooperate with and sort of network with groups like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty, which have broad appeal, you know, in the West, um, started, you know, their origins are really were as human rights groups. Now they are increasingly uh, sort of, uh, you know, tunnel vision about delegitimizing Israel. That is their business and how they work with these Palestinian NGOs, which are connected to terror. And what does this tell us about Human Rights Watch and Amnesty? It, this is the big network around the Palestinian network. It's really a, a they're, they're more than just a, a cushion. They're part of the legitimation process. They're part of the, the visibility process. Shawan Jabarin, we've talked about before, who is the, the uh, I think it's the executive director, whatever his title is, of Al Haq, is also a member of the Human Rights Watch Middle East Advisory Board. And if you, anybody who looks at Ken Roth's Twitter feed this week, is, he is, uh, Jabarin is Ken Roth's favorite uh, Palestinian human rights terrorist activist. Jabarin is also has a, uh, a executive or some position some high level position in the European version of Am uh, the, sorry, the French version of Amnesty, the uh, Confederation for the Federation for uh, uh, International Human Rights. So they're very well plugged in. 
Uh, and there are other individuals who have within this network of the, the seven organizations that have been named, the PLFP network, who are also uh, active and, and, and part of really uh, closely intertwined with the, the superpowers. Uh, it's more visible in the case of Human Rights Watch, somewhat less blatant in the case of Amnesty. I don't think anybody, I don't know of, of individuals that have positions. Amnesty is also a very confusing framework. It's, uh, they have this London Secretariat, I won't go into all the details, and then they have individual chapters and they overlap. Uh, there's Amnesty USA and they have, a, they have had, they have a person there whose full-time job is to write how terrible Israel is. But there are also people in London whose job it is to, to write reports on how Israel violates the human rights. Those reports will very often cite, quote, and use as the most accurate sources imaginable these same NGOs. So again, it, there is this, uh, the network, it, it, it overlaps. Uh, you can, uh, those of us who have the uh, fortune or misfortune of occasionally being in Geneva for the Human Rights Council meetings, and you can see the, human, the uh, press conferences that are held, uh, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty, basically the, 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 the amount of resources and monies and influence they have, you can't tell the difference between them and the UN officials. They're doing everything everywhere. They bring along their Palestinian uh, partners in, in all of this and give them that same visibility in the press conferences and in the, what are called side events, uh, other things that are there to attract uh, attention and also to, uh, to, to determine the agendas and the, uh, the contents of what the Human Rights Council does and what the journalists report on and the diplomats breathe and see and, and uh, participate in, in that framework. You can't do a Human Rights Council today without the, this cushion of NGOs and the Palestinians, or, or those Palestinian groups in particular, are right there in the middle of all this with Human Rights Watch, Amnesty, FIDH, and the other groups. Yeah, it, how do you know? In you know, in, in terms of their purpose, it all comes back to the apartheid state lie, doesn't it? I mean, that is at the core of the activism of these of these groups and of their their foreign network to you know, sort of basically to libel Israel's an apartheid state. How dangerous is that for Israel? Um, sometimes I get the feeling from people sort of in the Israeli government who you know, who take the, you know, traditional Zionist, you know, attitude of who cares what, you know, the world thinks about us, who cares what intellectuals on American college campuses think, who cares if a few left-wing politicians um, spout lies about Israel. But there's, it, there's more to it than just some people talking, isn't it? Yeah, I also think that uh, I agree with your characterization up until a few years ago, and then things began to change. Um, I will also add there, there's the war crimes allegations, sorry, there's the apartheid allegations, and then there are the war crimes allegations. And you see a, a playoff between the two. Again, you can follow these organizations and see if they'll do one theme for X number of months, then they'll go to the other one, there'll be a war in Gaza, they'll drop apartheid for a while, do war crimes and come back. It all goes through the International Criminal Court, the UN process, the various uh, statements by diplomats, condemnations, threats against Israel. Uh, all of these things. I think things began to change. Again, it's, uh, I'm an academic. I, I look at, uh, maybe, maybe overanalyze, but uh, the first sign that I saw, I, I should say, first of all, that you, this all goes back to Durban and the South African Durban mm -hmm. apartheid. Okay. Just to uh, clarify that, the uh, two th it, it happened a couple of days before the 9-11 attacks. It was a um, UN conference, an international conference uh, against uh, focused on fighting racism took place in Durban, South Africa, and it turned into basically an anti-Semitic hate fest with the, the whole focus of it being on demonizing, delegitimizing Israel. And the main actors in this, the main thrust of this was done through what's called the NGO Forum. And mm -hmm. there we have Al Haq and all the, these other, and, and Human Rights Watch. All the familiar and faces the, there, yes. This was already, this goes back 20 years. And they were doing it then. And then when I would, as I was starting to do this stuff and I'm beginning to look at NGOs as very uh, significant political actors that do a lot of damage, soft power warfare, all of that, 
that the there was nobody to talk to in the Israeli foreign ministry. They said, we deal with governments, not NGOs. Go have a good time. When the Goldstone Report came out in 2009, the report under the United Nations Human Rights Council that claimed in a 500 pages to document Israeli war crimes, but also had a couple chapters on uh, the apartheid uh, libel and had the same number of, of NGO sources as pages. There were about 500 sources they quoted from NGOs. And uh, at, the, at that point, and then a few similar events that happened afterwards, the Israeli military and the government began to pay attention. Netanyahu in particular, they're really gonna go ahead and, and push, and there may be a chance that the International Criminal Court in The Hague, this is now we're talking 12 years ago, that was the recommendation. Goldstone's recommendation was that the UN Security Council should recommend the opening up of a criminal investigation against Israel by the ICC. Goldstone then understood that uh, he didn't have a firm basis of fact. I'll put that mildly. I had a number of conversations with him at the time. He wrote his uh, quasi-retraction. Mm -hmm. But the Israeli government began to pay attention. It took a while. And uh, they, they be also began to debate how best to deal with it. To some, some of the responses were, if we now demonstrate that we have a, a very um, accurate and ent entirely um, substantiated, legitimate, there's a better term than that, foundation in, of, of military justice, that these courts operate and this, uh, the high court system operate according to the best standards of international law, they will realize that the 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 just the, the prosecutor, the judges in the International Criminal Court, and in the governments that fund the court will all realize that this is a, a complete um, farce to investigate Israel. They really had this faith that that was good. That was particularly among the legal community within the uh, the, the, the Israeli uh, foreign ministry, justice ministry, and military. As we get further along, and the ICC then. Uh, be, does accept jurisdiction and all sorts of other things happen. You get more reports, more recommendations in the Human Rights Council, all of which go back to the NGO sources and claims and, and uh, uh, quote evidence, then it, it begins to be taken seriously. So you have instances where not only Prime Minister Netanyahu, but also other members of the government, Yair Lapid, when he was head of the opposition, spoke out against the NGO um, attacks that lead to these kinds of uh, forms of delegitimization. So I think there's a much broader foundation now for uh, in Israel for understanding these have to be dealt with. I, I think that is also one of the reasons that the Ministry of Defense saw that this was something that they could be done also domestically and, and get supported and they are getting support. Yeah, explain a little bit. I think it's important to put it in perspective. In the United States, we're, we're having this huge debate about critical race theory, um, intersectionalism, which is a related ideology, and how it divides people and how it, you know, sort of characterizes not only Americans, but people elsewhere. How this these theories play into the, the work of these, you know, terrorist-related NGOs and their network, their international network of supporters and funders in delegitimizing Israel. Um, it, it's, it's not just about, you know, in America, we talk about what's going on, what's being taught in the schools. It's, it's broader than that. And it really has an impact on Israel, doesn't it? I, I explain a lot of things in the world through the NGO pr prism and then probably overstate it, but it's right there. That the intersectionality and there's also a post-colonial element, the West is evil and the, uh, the victims of colonialism are, and the people of color, these are all themes and variations. I think of that, that same, uh, I would say, ideological movement for want of a better term. And uh, so you see in many different ways how some of the same people we've been talking about, the same organizations become uh, very much put on a pedestal and are seen to represent the same type of ideas, which are completely antithetical. So you have an, or you have an is sort of well, you have a group called the Adala. I think it's called the Justice Movement. Mm 
Uh, there's also an Israeli version of Adala, mm -hmm. which is funded by the New Israel Fund. And, and they work very closely with these same Palestinian NGOs. They run events very often on campuses, in churches, and in other community settings in the United States. That, this is one example, there are many others. They're a one of pure 100% NGO, it's the Dollar Justice uh, Program. And uh, I believe they're funded in significant part by the Rockefeller Brothers Foundation mm -hmm. under the heading, the same headings of, of uh, intersectionality, but also Middle East peace. And they bring in not just the speakers, but the ideology, the content of the same NGO network. Then there are the Jewish, I, I call them the, uh, you probably have a better term for groups like uh, JVP, Jewish Voice for Peace, and if not now. Which are anti-Zionist groups. Anti-Zionist, uh, pseudo-Jewish, some are Jewish, some, some of the members are Jewish, some are not. Uh, they got also got a lot of money from particularly the Rockefeller Brothers Foundation. And they also give legitimacy. I've looked at their, their Twitter feeds in the last few days, and they are 100% fully, these are our brothers, the Palestinian NGOs that are being unfairly, uh, they're being silenced, that's uh, canceled by the Israeli government. Again, there's absolutely no engagement with the issue of terrorism or of the, the, the Israelis who've been killed by some of the same people. That's not on their agenda. So I think it, it is almost made to order, it fits in, and they're very aware of that. These organizations and the individual, the Palestinian groups know exactly how to talk the talk, walk the walk, feed in, and become adopted by all this. Then you have Linda Sarsour. All of these pieces right, are it's all like about a puzzle that fit together. A false analogy between um, the struggle for civil rights in the United States yes. and the Palestinian war on the existence of Israel. Um, yes. they, these are treated as, as two struggles which are part of the same struggle, when in fact, of course, they have nothing to do with each other. And in, in fact, the Palestinian war in Israel is illiberal and anti-democratic. It's, it's not a struggle for civil rights, um, but yet that is how it's characterized by these NGOs and by their international network of supporters. And that network has been working on this for 20 years. You know, in some ways there are also echoes of this. I, I had a conversation today that, Again, connecting the dots, 1975 was the UN General Assembly Resolution, Zionism is Racism. I won't go into the history, it, but that was, it was the Soviet bloc, it was the, uh, the, the Arab League, it was the Organization of Islamic, uh, uh, whatever it's called, the uh, OIC, uh, Islamic Conference, I think it was called in those days, and also some of the third world countries joined in. Then you pick it up again with the Durban conference back in, in 2001, which in many ways reactivated the 75 Zionism racism, the apartheid analogy, which has always been in there. They've been, and then since then, 20 years, they've been hitting the same bells constantly. Uh, Ken Roth and, and Human Rights Watch, I've done some pretty detailed uh, studies of them and uh, looking at their output. And you see the number of times they use the term apartheid in Israel. There's absolutely nothing like it in nothing comparable, the amount of uh, personnel and resources they put into these campaigns. So it resonates. Mm -hmm. And again, the close connection between Human Rights Watch and the same Palestinian network there, as they say, these are our brothers. Uh, and the, the theme of this is just like the American civil rights movement. As you said, there's absolutely nothing in common. It's the antithesis, but it's the great lie, and there's lots of money behind it. Mm -hmm. And, and part successful. of that that great lie is the idea that again, it's civil society. It's about helping people, but in the end, when you connect all of these dots, it is about promoting anti-Semitism, isn't it? It's about denying the rights to the Jews that you wouldn't think of denying to anyone else, denying the right of the Jewish state to exist and basically delegitimizing Israel and its supporters. Um, so it, it, it's not only not really civil society, it's the opposite. And, and even if you take terrorism out of the question, this is about propaganda that is fundamentally anti-Semitic, isn't it? Uh, yep, yeah, it's anti-Semitic and it, it's poisonous. The, the uh, point that you raised earlier about calling Israel an apartheid state or a racist state, if you're an apartheid state, you don't have the right to exist. Mm 
And that's exactly that goes again, go back to the Soviet led to the Arab League, the 75 resolution. If Zionism is racism, then there's no, uh, it's not about occupation. Mm-hmm. It's not about borders. It's not about policies. It's the right of the Jewish people to self It's certainly not about a two state solution or, not, or, or, or a, you know, a peace settlement because these groups, when, when prodded, they're not for peace with Israel on any terms, are they? There's uh, and they, the PFLP, which is what we're talking about, is the, the starting mm-hmm. point for this. And those NGOs are, they're also rejectionists. Mm-hmm. And I'm not a big fan of uh, Mahmoud Abbas and the Fatah organization and that wing of the dominant wing of the PLO, but they did accept Oslo, whatever we can do with that. These people in the PFLP said, no Oslo, no recognition, no Israel, no nothing. They right. stole our land back 48. It really is in all ways a 1948 agenda. It's a part of the blindness. Again, I understand the Palestinians doing this. It's harder to justify, explain, be silent when they're getting millions upon millions. I'll just throw this out here. There, we calculate, again, NGO monitors research, which probably has, is incomplete, but we can show about 120 million euros. That's going to these organizations, just these organizations in the last decade from European governments. There's probably more money that it's not transparent that we don't see. That's a huge chunk of cash mm-hmm. and it buys a whole lot of people. There's a whole thing going on now, uh, a controversy at the University of Toronto. They want to hire a, uh, a woman for a position in their human rights and international law clinic, who is essentially a graduate, if you look at her CV, of, of these organizations. Straight NGO career uh, pattern, including al Haq. And the, she was, uh, at the last minute, uh, she was uh, not, uh, last year, not um, given an offer for a job. And then a huge outcry arose that this is discriminatory. This is a woman who has written paper after paper with the same kind of language. She doesn't, it's not, these are not, mostly not academic papers. These are blog posts, these are, and within the NGO context. So my point is that this is a lot more than just about uh, whether they appear in the UN or whether they, even if they appear in Congress, They've built a very powerful network. They can pay for a lot of people and those people get out there and they bring in other people and then they get university positions and it is very much of a domino effect and they fit right in to the people of color. Also the, the, the women's groups adopt them immediately if they're, if they're women. Uh, so the gender issue becomes part of this intersectionality. It, they've played it very well to appeal to this process. And uh, in some ways you talked about the Israeli government uh, not being able or willing to deal with this. Perhaps also it's, it's also true of the, the sort of the, the uh, Jewish political leadership is- in, The organized Jewish world in or, this country. I think there was sort of wishful thinking for many years. I'm cautious because I'm not part of that world. I do see it occasionally, but there were times when uh, I, I think a more forceful uh, response rather than waiting for it to go away uh, or burn out, particularly when it began to eat into the, the Jewish support for Israel through these groups like, uh, if not now, and Jewish Voice for Peace, and to some degree, J Street, which has adopted part of this. Of all the things you've researched um, in all the years you've been working on NGO Monitor, what is the most surprising thing? I mean, obviously, you're not surprised that they're linked to terrorism. You're not, su- you know, you're not surprised that they're really doing just propaganda and anti-Semitism and not civil society work. What is the most surprising thing that, that you know that, that you've learned, and that American Jews know so little about? I don't know if there's a whole lot. That, you know, I've been doing it for too long. I've gotten very cynical. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's not a whole lot of things that surprise me, or at least uh, surprised you at the time that you learned it. I guess. I had a relatively naive, I say this uh, carefully, Mm -hmm. self-confession and all that, but uh, I had some expectations that when the, back in, uh, it's about the funding particularly, Mm -hmm. that back in the um, 
let's say, the 2004, 5, 6, 7. So a few years after the Durban conference that, uh, and, and where the NGOs were really revving up to go after Israel through BDS, through uh, lawfare, through the International Criminal Court, more and more visible. And I had even had a uh, email correspondence with Ken Roth, the head of Human Rights Watch, which was, I'd say somewhat, it, it was civil. And I, I raised some issues he, he wrote back and, and tried to convince me that I was wrong. I think he also thought that he could just uh, sucker me into saying, well, this is a legitimate criticism of Israel. The uh, willingness, not just the, the eagerness of the funders to do this, uh, the late Bob Bernstein, uh, I don't know if you had any contact with him. He was the founder of Human Rights mm -hmm. Watch. And I began to meet with him shortly after the Durban conference when Human Rights Watch was very much a focus of, because they have a big actors in, in the anti-Semitic and, and anti-Zionist process there. A gentleman by the name of Reed Brody who tried to rewrite his biography and say, no, no, I was opposed, no evidence of that. And I began to, to, to meet with Bob Bernstein. The first time he met me, he said, young man, I'll give you five minutes. I was told I should meet with you, but I won't believe anything you have to say. Then it became a half an hour, and then it became five hours with the board of, of Human Rights Watch. And then Bernstein wrote this amazing piece he published in the New York Times in 2009, right. in which he essentially denounced his own organization. And I can tell you how painful it was for him to get to that stage. They had lost their moral compass. They were leading the delegitimization of Israel. All, and this was after, right after the Goldstone report. So it was all building up to where Human Rights Watch was a central actor. And so when Bernstein wrote this denunciation of his own organization, and when most of the funders that had been part of the funding, the support group that Bernstein had brought in, Bernstein, who had come back from the Soviet Union in the 1970s and said, Helsinki, which was called the Human Rights Front, I'm going to, to develop a movement which is going to be more activist than Amnesty was at the time, and had his heart broken. And I had assumed that that, that was a very severe, that was the end of Ken Roth. He would be forced to resign. There would be new leaders. They would either that or they'd run out of money. And then in comes George Soros and gives them a $100 million pledge and other groups rush in and, and they're back in business, completely back in business. Uh, and then I see other things where in the European funding issues, even more recently after the, uh, the arrest and, and in one case a conviction already of uh, the, P the PFLP, slash NGO um, cell that killed, that murdered Rina Schnerb. The evidence was clear. And in fact, a couple of European ministers were asked in parliament and they said, the evidence we've seen it, we're gonna freeze the funding. It's possible to the Netherlands. It's we believe that the, our money that we paid to this organization paid the salary. We have evidence, we're gonna check into it. And okay, you think this is gonna be taken seriously? Two years, sorry, you said, well, not quite two years passed. <clears throat> the European Union announces they're going to do an investigation. Nothing. And the money comes, they freeze it in this direction. It comes from a different framework. They give the money to the UN. The UN gives the money to the same organizations. It's, it's whack-a-mole. And again, there, I, I'm, I continue to, to be, uh, have expectations that people who are providing, enabling, funding, supporting will see that it, it actually hurts their own image and interests and it, nothing changes. They're so deeply entrenched. I, I'm, I think that, again, I'm being somewhat optimistic, maybe naive, that now that the Israeli Ministry of Defense has defined these organizations as terror groups and is sending the, and Ned Price said he didn't have the information, the Israeli Deputy Foreign Minister said, I briefed people on this, uh, just before this, the, the, the thing was made public or before it was made public. It's not something that suddenly showed up. They, they, this issue has been out there for a while, uh, not the specifics, but the general uh, terror links. Maybe now the, the taps will start to be closed because it'll be harder to sustain giving millions of euros. The US, by the way, does not fund any of this. That, I have to say that's important. Your, your Americans have been much, partly because of congressional oversight, much more careful in general about funding Palestinian NGOs. Europeans, it's just wide open. Will they learn anything now? I, yeah, uh, semi-optimistic, semi-naive, and, and semi-cynical.
Well, Gerald, you've given us so much to think about um, in terms of framing this issue and the general one about this war on Israel uh, in general. Um, thank you for coming on um, and for what you do at NGO Monitor. Um, thank you to our audience for tuning thank in you. today, uh, listening to us uh, on Spotify and all the other audio links and uh, wherever you hear podcasts or if you're watching it on the JNS YouTube channel or eventually on JBS TV. Please like, subscribe, follow our podcast, give us good reviews. And um, thank you again for doing so. And we'll see you next week. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode brought to you by the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org. Visit us at JNS.org and please follow at Amazon and Spotify wherever you listen to podcasts.